The Making of a Cougar. Born and raised in San Antonio, the eldest daughter of a school teacher mother and Air Force father, Carrie Ann's parents emphasized education, discipline, and a good celebration. She was a Texas fusion of Teutonic values, grit, optimism, and grandeur. Her name, more Scandinavian than German, was chosen by her mother, who declared, I like the ring of that name, and that's what it's going to be. And there was no arguing with Susanna once she decided. Carrie Ann's mother pronounced Susanna, descended from Germans who migrated to the Texas Hill Country in the 1850s, the same folks who brought the Lone Star State German beer making techniques and the polka. Prost! Unlike Southern Baptist and strict Germans for whom beer and dancing were taboo, Carrie Ann's forefathers were Rhinelanders who enjoyed a good fest in the old country and, after immigrating to Texas, combined their zest for life and a good party with hard work. Throw in a dose of Texas size ambition, and there you have the basic ingredients of a Carrie Ann. Over half of Texas counties are semi dry, with alcohol sales regulated. Even in the capital, Austin, known for its moniker, Keep Austin Weird, and its famous 6th Street, lined by taverns, bars, honky tonks, Esther's Follies, and a tattoo parlor, revelers could be fined, if not arrested, for carrying open containers on the sidewalk, even outside a restaurant named Moonshiners, as Carrie Ann learned. Not so in Fredericksburg, less than 80 miles away and the center of German settlement in Texas, where Main Street includes craft breweries, tasting rooms for several local wineries, and a distillery where visitors are encouraged to carry libations outside as they meander and shop along the sidewalk. This is the kind of open carry law supported by the Bootleggers Express. As a child, Susanna attended Sunday school at Fredericksburg's Evangelische Lutheranische Bethenen in Gemeinde and brought Carrie Ann there to be baptized in 1955, by which time the church had adopted its current English name, Bethany, Bethany Evangelical Lutheran Church. After the ceremony, Susanna's father brought everyone to the bakery across the street for cake and coffee, after which the assembly walked next door for beers, and the proud grandfather dipping his finger into a stein and inserting several drops of brew into the infant's mouth. At Susanna's insistence, Carrie Ann attended Sunday school at the Lutheran Church near their home in San Antonio through middle school. But there's no evidence religion stuck, as later in life she spent Sundays in the vineyard or tasting room. Carrie Ann grew up admiring men in uniform. Her father, based in San Antonio's Lackland Air Force Base, served in the Korean War and as an active advisor to the French in Vietnam until their defeat. Although they didn't call it PTSD when Carrie Ann was growing up, she remembered her father confiding to her, Daddy sometimes woke up in the middle of the night with nightmares, his invisible scars from war. After more than 20 years of service, he retired and began a second career at USAA, the San Antonio-based company that serves the financial and insurance needs of military personnel and their families. Carrie Ann used USAA to insure her fire-prone property. Tutored by her mother, Carrie Ann started reading and multiplication at a young age and was selected for the advanced math track. By the time she finished elementary school, the family had moved to San Antonio's King William district where wooden gables and eaves of older homes were handcrafted, Susanna falling in love with the quaint neighborhood that reminded her of her family's homestead. Her mother taught her the real estate value. It's better to buy a modest house in a wealthy neighborhood than the best house in an average neighborhood. The family's home was modest compared to the historic mansions dominating the area. The homes look better today than they did when Carrie Ann was a child thanks to the King William Historic Society that worked to preserve and restore the older, grander homes. And the trees are taller, <clears throat> shading the neighborhood during sauna-like summers. No wonder I like palms and magnolias so much, reflected Carrie Ann on a recent visit. I grew up with them. Inquisitive by nature, Carrie Ann enjoyed school as much as sports and hunting. 
San Antonio's San Antonians have a special bond to the Alamo and its heroes, including James Bowie, who lent his name to the Bowie knife her father taught her to use. As the oldest child, her father brought her to his lease to bag a deer and fish, and she learned the fine arts of scraping scales off a bass, developing an aversion to the smell, and skinning the hide off a buck. When Carrie Ann was in the eighth grade, she and her mother were driving back to San Antonio from the hill country one Sunday at, at dusk after visiting her grandparents. As they approached the outskirts of Comfort, a 12-point buck bolted across the two-lane road in pursuit of a mate. Susanna slammed the brakes, the car skidded, and fortunately for the passengers, it wasn't a direct head-on collision that would have assaulted them with body-piercing hooves and antlers through the windshield. Carrie Ann screamed as the car rammed the buck. Let's inspect the damage, Suzanne said calmly. They saw the large animal lying in the road humbled, gasping for breath, a wounded whale on the beach with antlers. Carrie Ann, you're a big girl now, and this is what we have to do. The buck is suffering, and we don't want him to suffer, right? No, ma'am. We need to put him out of his misery, right? Yes, ma'am. She opened the undamaged trunk of the badly dented car and pulled out a flashlight and bowie knife, passing the handle to her daughter. Take it. But Mama, we don't want the buck to suffer, right? No, ma'am. Carrie Ann took the knife, and her mother held the badly injured deer down to keep him from flaying and pointed to the spot. Slid his throat along here. Carrie Ann, who had already skinned a deer with her father, cut with authority. A single stroke across the throat, <laughs> covering her hand with warm, wet ink as the deer bled out and came to rest. Mother and daughter dressed the deer, taking home the best cuts, venison being too good to waste. And whenever Carrie Ann removed her hands from a batch of red wine, she remembered the blood of that buck. Back then, San Antonio students could apply to attend any high school in the district. Susanna recommended Carrie Ann look at Thomas Jefferson High School, located five miles from their neighborhood, one of the nation's most highly rated schools in the 1930s when it was built. Carrie Ann fell in love with the campus at first sight. TJ's main building was three stories and made of stone, dominated by a clock tower. The 15-year-old got a driver's license and a summer job to help pay for a car to commute to school. A talented athlete with a fondness for hunting, she competed on an equal footing with boys, demonstrating this on the tennis court. And when she walked, and when she talked her way onto onto the high school's all boys Toastmasters club, the club supervisor, head of the science department, was impressed by her logic, and encouraged her to take AP science classes. When Carrie Ann entered TJ, she already knew differential calculus and used it to solve physics problems. She took to chemistry instead of cheerleading, despite pleas from the cheerleading coach because of her athleticism and outgoing energetic personality. Perhaps there was something in her genes that drew her to chemical experiments, especially combining two elements to create hydrogen sulfide, a poisonous gas with a rotten egg odor. The chemistry teacher explained was used, was used by Germany in the First World War. You're not going to teach Carrie Ann the Kraut how to make poison gas, wise, craze, wise cracked a classmate. She'll gas us all. After class, Carrie Ann challenged the boy to a duel on the tennis court with rackets instead of lugers. She whipped him six games to two, and that was the last time she was referred to as the Kraut or a Nazi publicly in school, since she had the skill to decapitate or castrate you with the swing of her racket. Besides, she was a distant relative of Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, a favorite son of Fredericksburg and World War II hero. The only time she compared herself to a Nazi was 35 years later, when she was stalking a mouse who hid six months in a corner of her house until captured by Karl Rove, the neighbor's cat. In mouse years, Six years in hiding was equivalent to 1939 through 1944 in occupied Holland. Carrie Ann didn't imagine how useful the ability to detect trace elements of hydrogen sulfide would become 
an odor as undesirable in wine as when making love. Much to her consternation, thirty years later during the harvest, when she joyously sipped sweet nectar of raw grape juice laced with the preservative potassium metabisulfide, she leaked an aroma of hard-boiled eggs left in the basket months after Easter that trailed her behind, which her nose and that of Bluey the dog easily detected. In impolite society, it was said she farted. Deadly ones, sometimes loud. Carl Rove was staying with Carrie Ann while his owners vacationed. Ever since she gave Cougar Cub Shasta IV a trim at the University of Houston's barber shop, Carl Rove provided the feline fix she needed. In the middle of the night, as he slept between the warm V of her legs, a violent one erupted. The elephant call startling the cat, who leapt from her bed and sprinted across the house, breaking the land speed record for North American mammals. To assess the health of her grape fermentations, Carrie Ann tasted the sulfite infused grape juice that fueled her flatulence. She developed quite a nose for the odor, a fragrance the scent sommelier never marketed for good reason, often detecting the scent, regrettably, in her wines. TJ High School had several social clubs and, in addition to the Toastmasters, Carrie Ann joined the Shakespeare Club, which sparked her interest in theater, though she never had time to participate in plays. Her good, fr her good friend Laurie joined the Lassos, a service organization of young ladies skilled with the rope, and taught Carrie Ann basic lasso skills. Carrie Ann hung a lasso in her winery, and whenever a guest request requested a demonstration, she said, put a 20 in the cougar's kitty and thrust a tip jar in front of the patron. She'd fetch the lasso and be begin the lasso of circular motion to levitate the loop. And when the rope had built enough momentum, she tossed it around the surprised guest. Once, after installing a gentleman, she bundled her prey like a spider. And when she was next to her bound, bound up, he received an unexpected kiss. The afternoon she lassoed Paul after a shift of wine tasting was the day he fell in love with her, either then or when they were united after the great fire. Carrie Ann was too young to participate in the 1967 Summer of Love. When she started high school in 1970, most of the young women of Thomas Jefferson were said to be good girls. By the time she graduated, the culture was changing with rumors of drug use and secret abortions. About as mischievous as Carrie Ann got was, occupying, was accompanying a football player she admired on Rap Patrol when he and his teammates surveyed the school's parking lot to make sure all was in order and they snuck a warm beer in the car. And here's a cold one. During a tennis team practice her senior year, she traded long rallies and points with the number two player on the boys team. They played to a 6-6 tie and the coach told them fight it out instead of playing a tiebreaker. The contest continued evenly to 12 games apiece. The coach told her, you're playing country club tennis. If you want to be well liked, let him win. If you want to be a champion and leader of this team, put him away. Don't keep lobbing the ball back to wear him down. Hit to win. Carrie Ann reset her mind to winning and won the next two games and the match. From that day, she applied her unleashed competitive instinct to sports and life to be a winner. She could beat most boys at tennis, hold her own at the Hold'em poker table, skin a deer, smoke meat, and barbecue better than most, which was cool as a teenager and a young adult. Until the boys noticed, when they worked in the same company, she outperformed them. She was tougher than Bevo, the Longhorn skin, skin hide, when it came to business. She was attractive. The boys saw conquering her as their Everest. The only problem for them was, as a sign of the times to come, she had no interest in getting married just yet. She had it in her mind, instilled from her mother, to go to college and not marry until after she was established in her career. Some of her classmates married right after high school. 
most married before 25. Here was a young lady tough enough to finish off a deer with her hands, swim the, swim the sharks on surfing vacations to Indonesia, and earn the Top Gun Sales Award as the number one sales rep for a Fortune 500 company. In retirement, she would use the same skills, instincts, and drive to impact the wine industry, along the way becoming a notorious gopher hunter who beat Miguel in a gopher roundup. Only Snake Man outdid her in the rattlesnake roundup she organized for the area's vineyards, with Snake Man insisting and Carrie Ann finally agreeing to catch and release. Now, you think she succeeded because of her looks. Sure, she was born with a mop of blonde hair, which gradually darkened as she grew older. In high school, she doused it with lemon juice to reveal yellow highlights, since she spent a lot of time outside playing tennis. And after moving to California, she dyed it to restore its natural color. With all the calisthenics her father drilled into her youth and all the exercises spring across the tennis court, combined with distance training, she grew up fit, and fitness stayed with her. Looks didn't hold her back, but it was her maturity and common sense that stood out although good sense diminished after the third drink. Chemistry was her favorite subject and, and its teacher also her favorite. She aced the AP chemistry exam. With high grades and strong ACT, ACT scores, she could have gone to college anywhere. The University of Texas at Austin was an obvious candidate, along with Southern Method Methodist University in Dallas. What a beautiful campus which even offered a partial scholarship. But she longed for something different. As so many of her friends going to the UT, that would have been too much like high school. As for the private SMU, even with a partial scholarship, it was pricey, as were other private schools. Her chemistry teacher, an example of how good teachers positively influence their students and change lives, suggested she apply to the University of Houston's chemical engineering program. Houston. Whatever good came from Houston? That sprawling octo octopus megalopolis. What could possibly attract a San Antonio girl with roots in the hill country to the big city? She wanted nothing to do with it and went to the school's guidance counselor for advice. After a productive meeting with the counselor, she ran up to her father when he came home from work and throwing her arms around him, Daddy, you're home. The captain was on guard. Dad, I've been thinking about college. The guidance counselor told me about this school called Stanford. It's in California. It's one of the best schools in the country. And she says I could get in and it would be perfect for, fit for me. What do you think? I think if you go to college in California, you can pay for it. Deflated by the ephemeral high of her nascent California dream, she recalled what her chemistry teacher told her about the University of Houston. She went to her room picked up her thick college directory and turned to the UH's pages. The more she read, her interest grew. Houston represented the great unknown, and with the oil shocks of the early 1970s and gasoline prices rising, the perpetual seesaw roller coaster economy that was Houston was on the upswing, an oil boom swelling, and the sea, named after the legendary hero of the Texas independence, represented a challenge, a chance to expand her horizons. If she could make it in Houston, she could make it anywhere. Where is the Sinatra song about Houston? She decided to, to visit the campus and drove there on her own. There was something about the campus that clicked. Perhaps it was the largest chemistry lab she had ever seen, or the prospect of a high paying job after graduation as demand for chemical engineers to fuel the rising oil industry increased or joining a team of NASA engineers who worked nearby at Mission Control near UH's Clear Lake campus, or, or was, it, was it the school's mascot, Shasta the Mountain Lion? In the autumn of 1974, Carrie Ann matriculated at the UH, where her motto was, study hard, party hard. She signed up for a pre-engineering program and soon found her interest in chemistry and biology were greater than tennis. At the time, the university didn't... Okay, I found this on the... At the time, uh, the university didn't field a, a varsity t women's tennis team, 
But that was destined to change after Carrie Ann appeared on campus with a passion for equality, athletic talent, and the passage of Title IX that pressured academic institutions receiving federal funds to sponsor women's athletics programs on par with the men's. The year she graduated was the same year the Lady Shasta's tennis team was founded. By then, Carrie Ann's tennis ambitions were grounded when she overreached for a ball, tripped, and ripped a meniscus her first year, her official retirement from the competitive game, allowing her to concentrate on her studies, except when guys wanted to carry, sign her cast in the library or carry her books to her dorm. After the injury, Carrie Ann studied so hard, she neglected the hanging plants in her room. By spring break, an inter intervention was necessary. I'm giving your plants to a friend who will care for them, her roommate Carol announced. Thanks for doing that. I've got to prepare for midterms. Carol arranged to give Carrie Ann's plants to two friends from her botany class. One was Chib, a happy-go-lucky Florida native from West Palm Beach, Florida, with a green thumb. The other was Jenny Lee, as you know, pronounced Jenny Lee, a gal from the Texas countryside who, since the elevator was out, out of order, marched up 12 flights of stairs in Moody Tower's dorm to Carrie Ann's room to liberate the survivors. So you're the plant murderer, asked Jenny Lee. You should be arrested for plant abuse. And you're the plant rescuer. Are you some kind of left-wing tree hugger? What if I am? You deserve a medal. I'm Carrie Ann. Pleased to meet you. My friends call me Jenny Lee, and you may call me that too. Where are you all from? Hill Country, outside Fredericksburg. My grandparents are from there, Carrie Ann said with a spark of interest. Really? Tell me about going up there, said Carrie Ann. And as Jenny Lee talked and talked, Carrie Ann listened and questioned, interested in hearing from a contemporary about life in the Hill Country. She showed Jenny Lee her scrapbook, including a picture of Carrie Ann as a young girl standing next to her grandma holding a chicken on her porch in a Fredericksburg home before cutting off its head. And as Jenna Lee admired the photos, Carrie Ann admired Jenna, Jenna Lee's thick, long locks. They quickly became friends, as it's so easy for young adults to do. It was with Jenny Lee, during a road trip to Austin, the two Shastas plotted to outmaneuver Bevo, the bovine longhorn mascot of the University of Texas. After a night of ball crawling, sampling beer, and music from half a dozen honky-tonks along 6th Street. They ended up at a tattoo parlor, and as Jenna Lee got her second tattoo, Carrie Ann received her first, a defiant act of independence, another step to adulthood. Following the succession of first menses, she was one of the first of her grade, first cigarette, first kissed, first drink, and loss of virginity, which in the years before the casual hooks, hookups of this generation was taken seriously. In Carrie Ann's case, her skin was punctured by the colored needle of the tattoo artist before her hymen. Jenny Lee ha had Shasta the Cougar forever stitched to her skin strategically placed on her left cheek where the sun doesn't shine, unless you're sun sunbathing in the south of France or, or your back porch in Southern California. Carrie Ann chose a butterfly, fascinated by the incredible flight of the monarchs, which regularly visited her milkweed patch in San Diego. I can't believe I got a tattoo. I can't believe it. I'm so excited, said Jenny Lee, that my mom's going to kill me. Why? She thinks my body is hers and I have to keep it pure. She sounds like my grandmother. What's she like? Oh, she's a hoot. Before starting school, she told me about when she went to college and got campus for staying out five, five minutes past curfew. She had to go before the judicial board and was almost expelled. She told me this as a warning to behave. Now look at us. Look at you. Susanna might have killed her. Certainly she would mourn for days the scarring of her only daughter's precious skin. But Carrie Ann had the good sense to get her tattoo in a place the sun didn't shine. Her second tattoo was also a declaration of independence, a release from a corporate world that treated her well financially, but took a toll in office politics, pay inequity, and occasional harassment. 
workplace changes would come, but after she left the rat race. Wine work was harder in many ways, more rewarding in others, but she would control her own destiny. She had been thinking of signaling her fresh start with a tattoo, and facing the cougar in the vineyard was a sign to embrace the new identity. While Carrie Ann was pounding chemistry books and tennis balls in high schools, Jenna Lee starred in her high school's plays. At the center of town where she grew up was a theater and a river ran under it, the same river where, where she intertubed, threw rocks at bullfrogs, and bugs walked on water until captured by Jenna Lee and her brothers, legs plucked, bodies sun-fried under the focus beam of a magnifying glass. What Jenna Lee lacked from not taking AP biology, she learned at the creek dissecting frogs, worms, and critters. She loved the water, spending summer days by the river and evenings at the theater, taking workshops and performing. Jenna Lee was an artist at heart who loved to draw, and in high school stumbled into an introductory architecture class. Surprisingly, she liked the class and was good at drafting. And it would, when it became time to think about college, she looked for one with an architectural school. Her grandmother, living in Houston, she suggested the UH and generally liked what she saw. Did the mascot have anything to do with it? At first glance, they were an odd pairing, as more often than not, when cliques formed in high school and college, alike liked the like, and Jenna Lee and Carrie Ann were opposites. Big city gal versus country gal, jock versus thespian, straight A student versus straight for the tattoo parlor. They, though they differed in nurture, they were, by their stock, cut from the same nature. They would have made an odd couple, but as opposites attract in relationships, after Carrie Ann's induction into the sisterhood of the tattooed, they were destined to be best friends forever. Their clique was rounded out by a Stephanie of Mexican ancestry and admiringly nicknamed Yellow Rose by her classmates in reference to the Texas beauty who, in an afternoon of lovemaking with Generalissimo Santa Ana, tired out the victor of the Alamo, so he lost his mojo in the Battle of San Jacinto, giving Sam Houston and the Texas Army their revenge and Texas its independence. When Steph walked into a room, her yellow leather, leather skin tone stood out like a full moon on a clear night, and you couldn't help but stare. By her senior year, after three years of a liberal arts education and growth in political awareness, when someone called her a yellow rose, she struck back, call me the Chicano chick. She never took offense when the band of the three young ladies was called Las Tres Amigas, although Steph spoke little Spanish. She was every bit as Texan and American as Carrie Ann, and as for her lovemaking abilities, while well, I'm not old enough to have been around at the dawn of Texas independence, after I got to know Steph when she had been out of college many years, I challenged her to prove she was as good as the Yellow Rose. As a gentleman, I'll say no more about it, except I married her. I shouldn't make light of Steph's political awakening. She eagerly joined a planning meeting of the Concilio des Organizaciones Chicanas and the Mexican-American Studies Program that co-sponsored Chicano History Week on campus and was excited to meet community activists, but turned off by the piñata bashing demonstration that was so stereotypical. However, she met a community leader working with families of incarcerated Latinos who suggested, after learning about Steph's involvements with Houston Shakespeare Festival, she apply her passion for the theater to children of the incarcerated, many of whom were Latino, to provide a creative outlet to allow Los Niños to be heard, validated, and respected using theater techniques. For this, she was all in. At the beginning of their junior year, Jenny Lee dared Carrie Ann to attend auditions for the UH Drama Department's musical production of Candide, an operetta by Leonard Bernstein, adopted from a story by Voltaire. It was an ambitious production, but Sidney Berger, founder of Houston Shakespeare Festival, director of the production, and de facto Mr. Theater at the UH, 
was well equipped for the challenge and saw something in Carrie Ann, who, with no previous experience on stage, but with some basic theater knowledge gained from her membership in the Shakespeare Club, was offered a role in the course, while Jenna Lee was given a leading role. No surprise there, for Jenna Lee was good. And while Jenny Lee, Carrie Ann, and Chip graced the stage, Steph worked backstage as stage manager, pulling the production together and running it. The three amigas were, in Jenna, Lee wor Jenna Lee's words, as, inse as inseparable as stink on a dog, spending most of their waking hours together working on the production, and after rehearsals, studying past midnight, trying to keep up with coursework. Carrie Ann still managed to achieve straight A's, although the one spider plant she purchased started wilting from lack of attention, and Chip stepped in for a minor rescue. Carrie Ann's experience in the course enhanced her presentation skills. She practiced clear enunciation, controlled breathing, and voice projection, shaping her into a strong public speaker. She learned to sing which came in handy when a future boss handed her a karaoke mic while on a business dinner with clients. And the theater broadened her social circles as she hung out with actors instead of chemists. Chip's smile and carefree laid-back attitude taught her to loosen up and take life less seriously. The day of the opening performance, Steph purchased a dozen roses for Jenny Lee and Carrie Ann, who were flushed with joy. She wrote, Dearest Car Jenny Lee and Carrie Ann, perhaps you will never fully comprehend how much your friendship means to me. I'm so proud of the two of you and your talents for the stage. It's amazing to have watched you grow into your roles during these weeks of rehearsals. When I was in the infirmary with tonsillitis, it was you two who were there for me and helped get me back on my feet in time for the production. You two are the definition of true friendship. Break legs this evening, and may our friendship never be broken. Love and friendship forever. Your Stephanie. Carrie Ann drank so much during the cast party she blacked out and woke up sandwiched between Jenna Lee and Steph with normally hidden tattoos exposed. After that night, Carrie Ann exerted her German gene willpower and common sense, never to pass out again. Not counting when you have a large glass of wine with dinner, go to bed with a book, and wake up with the light on at 2.30 a.m. with only three pages read. There was no danger in that. But drinking so much without a drop of memory of what you did, not to mention how lousy she felt, wasn't going to happen again. Part of Carrie Ann's fascination for Jenna Lee was wondering is this a person I'd be if I grew up in the hill country? Jenna Lee was a Texas country gal with style who had all the makings of someone who would become larger than life. Her hazelnut eyes were welcoming and she wore a friendly smile and handcrafted cow cowgirl boots. It was the age of Farrah Fawcett and big hair, but whereas Farrah's was styled for Hollywood, Jenna Lee's was naturally styled for Texas Hills. Jenna Lee's hair was thick as a horse's mane, and Carrie Ann loved running her hands through it as she brushed it straight, separated it into three strands, then crossed one over the other into a tight ponytail, while Jenna Lee relaxed, her hair tamed by her friend. You could say the same about Bluey when brushed by Paul. He felt loved. Imagine the companionship a well-groomed, well-cared-for dog feels for his best friend. Such were the feelings between these two young women. As Carrie Ann remained a bachelorette into her 50th year, some of the neighbors wondered if she never married because, to put it politely, she preferred women. The answer to that is none of your business, and I never asked. In 10th grade, she practiced kissing with Lasso Lori. Although the experience was awkward, it wasn't unpleasant, but sparks didn't fly. Perhaps the byproducts of her inner, inner, inner fermentations scared away less brave suitors. From what I saw, she sure had her conquest of men. She was, after all, the cougar of the county. 
She never had a financial incentive to marry. She made more money than most men, and early in her career, she reasoned marriage would hold her back. Maybe it was just bad luck and bad timing. I'll say this. Paul had the companionship of Bluey, and Carrie Ann had the internal friendship of Jenna Lee and Steph. When geographic distance between them grew after college, their bonds never waned. Their senior year, the three were contemplating jobs. Steph was looking for ways to combine her interest in criminal justice with her passion for theater. Jenna Lee believed she would change the world by becoming a school teacher to educate children. She asked Carrie Ann, what do you want to do after graduating? Drill an oil well? S S Steph noticed a posting for a position at Huntsville State Penitentiary with a salary sufficient to quickly pay off her student loans. She double-dog dared her friends to apply with her, and they did. With her cor coursework in criminal justice, an essay describing how theater techniques positively impacted children she tutored, she tutored of incarcerated parents, it was Steph's destiny to work at the notorious men's prison as a jailer. It makes me cringe imagining the yellow rose surrounded by Texas thorns. Maybe better not to, for she was exposed to things a young woman should never experience. Curious about how such a fine, good-looking gal could have possibly worked at a prison, she shuddered when I asked, recalling the screams of men raped in night's darkness. She was a tough cookie, that's for sure. Jenna Lee spent another year at the UH to get her master's in education and found a teaching position at a district in the fast-going northern suburbs of the Big D. With ambitions larger than Texas borders, Carrie Ann joined an oil company outside Texas, accepting an offer with Chevron in San Francisco. Carrie Ann's job was to make sure everything ran smoothly and in process at the oil refinery where she worked. She spent much time on narrow ladders at great heights inspecting machinery and towering structures. The job paid well and was sometimes adventuresome, climbing scaffolding, but watching gauges and dials was not the career to which she aspired. She made up for the monotony on the job with weekend excursions to Pacific beaches, Redwood Forest, Yosemite National Park, and Candlestick Park during baseball and football seasons. When Carrie Ann attended her first house party in California, she was surprised to see lemon and orange trees in the backyard. That was something to aspire to. Pick your own citrus right off the tree. Then there was Napa. She arrived in San Francisco two years after the judgment of Paris wine tasting when Napa's winery shared the world stage with France's finest and the upstart Californians held their own. Chateau Montalena, one of the American winners in France, became one of Carrie Ann's favorites. Napa was a destination for the young, upwardly, upwardly mobile urban professionals, the yuppies, who lived in the Bay Area, while, where Carrie Ann and her friends could visit one half dozen or the other wineries in a day. Her taste in fine California wines trickled down to Paul when he won from her a bottle of Chateau Montalena in a bet, fortunately after his scent of smell was restored, which opened up his taste buds to just how good California wine could be. This is the kind of trickle-down economics favored by the Bootlegger's Express. With good California wines becoming more expensive, Carrie Ann told friends, when I retire, I'm going to learn how to make my own wine to save money. While Carrie Ann was prancing around Northern California, Jenna Lee was acclimating to Dallas social scene, a whole other world from that of a Houston graduate student. First, she redid her hair. The stylist gawked at Jenna Lee when she walked through the door with her thick mare's mane. To him, her hair was a block of fine marble, and with Michelangelo's hands, he shaped it Dallas style. Jenna Lee started wearing her hair up and was as beautiful as any Dallas millionaire's daughter. 
She joined a ballroom dance club that hosted dance parties Friday evenings. One of her colleagues at school told her the best place to find a date was the grocery store, where eligible bachelors and bachelorettes donned their finest clothes Friday evenings to shop. At the store, Genevieve spied a, belt, a well-built man about 30 years old wearing a Neiman Marcus suit with spit-polished rodeo boots. She pointed him out to her friend, who nudged her to talk with the stranger. She took a deep breath, walked on stage, and recited her opening line. Howdy, cow cowboy. Oh my, you've got all the groceries now, don't you? And that's how she met Harlan. Back in San Francisco, one of Carrie Ann's wine pals worked as an advise, advertising executive for the Rough Times, an investment newsletter published by Howard Ruff, who advised clients to invest in commodities. Carrie Ann was making good money and had learned from her parents the importance of a disciplined approach to saving and investing. With her knowledge of the oil industry and a keen sense of how markets would react to the next oil crisis, she put some of her savings to work with Ruff's firm, investing in oil futures and gold. She profited. Another one of her wine pals worked at Charles Schwab, the San Francisco-based pioneer at dis of discount brokerages. Carrie Ann signed up for an investment account and attended a few investment seminars. She was lucky enough or clever enough to invest in an emerging San Francisco biotech company called Genentech that skyrocketed. Carrie Ann pocketed her gains by selling her holdings in gold, oil, and Genentech stock, and by age 26 was on her way to financial independence. One weekend, she drove to Palo Alto to visit Stanford, whose suburban location art architecture stood in stark contrast to the University of Houston but reminded her of a larger, magnificent version of her high school. She explored the campus, from the golden hills of the linear accelerator to the library, where she spent an hour roaming the stacks, then poked her head inside the business school. Carrie Ann wasn't satisfied with her work, and in the job-hopping culture of San Francisco and Silicon Valley, she was contemplating a change. She had, a strong, te she had strong technical skills, but knew little about management, and to advance her career, she would need to transition from engineer to manager. Studying at Stanford Business School would broaden her business connections and open new doors in the Bay Area and around the country. Instead of j changing jobs, she applied. When the admissions committee saw her experience and GMAT scores, they welcomed her with open arms. She called home with the news. Dad, do you remember when you told me if I wanted to go to college in California, I could pay for it myself? Did I say that, sweetie? He would do anything for his daughter. I've been accepted to Stanford's MBA program, and I'm going to pay for it myself. God bless the child who's got her own. Carrie Ann used Stanford to learn skills, to learn what she didn't know. She got along fabulously with her cohort and ace the courses in operations management. Well, that's what she had been doing at Chevron. She sought courses in marketing, finance, and leadership. There was much talk about entrepreneurship, and she took a course on it, during which she and her teammates contacted Stanford's Office of Technology Licensing and were paired with a faculty member at the medical school who had developed an assay to detect osteoporosis. Business students were encouraged to find summer internships between their first and second year. The osteo osteoporosis venture was early stage, and Carrie Ann noticed a position posted in the school's placement office with Gen Genentech's business development department. She was curious to find out more, since her investment in the company's stock funded her graduate education. Genentech had invented genetically engineered synthetic insulin and was reviewing strategies to bring it to market. Carrie Ann applied and was accepted for the summer project. She found the work challenging, fascinating, and meaningful as the innovation could positively impact millions of lives.
she poured herself into the work and drafted a proposal outlining two options. One was licensing the technology to a pharmaceutical company with the infrastructure to manufacture and sell it worldwide. The second was for Genentech to build a new business and market the drug itself. Her arguments for both cases were well reasoned and her work impressed the department's senior manager. Her final semester at Stanford, Carrie Ann got a call from staff. Do you remember Chip from school? Of course, he's so adorable. Why do you ask? He moved to San Francisco several years ago. Wish I'd known. Would love to see him. Oh, please, go see him, Carrie Ann, she said with urgency. He doesn't sound good. What's wrong? I don't know. He wouldn't say. General Lee says she wouldn't be surprised if he's got AIDS. Jesus Christ, Steph. You know, it's in the papers out here every day. Men dropping like flies after being sprayed with raid. Why don't you fly out here and let's visit him together? It's really hard for me to get away from prison right now. They got you locked up too? I bet you and Ali could get out there pretty soon. School's winter break is coming up. They were really close, weren't they, being in all those plays together. I'll call her up and invite her out for a visit. When Jenna Lee arrived at San Francisco Air Airport, Carrie Ann was at the gate to meet her, surprised how much she had changed. It was the makeup and hair. She had gone Dallas style and wore it up, the all-natural country girl who rarely wore makeup outside the theater. It was a completely different look and looked good. No wonder she was married to Harlan within two years of moving to Dallas. They got into Carrie Ann's car for the drive into San Francisco, passing the Chevron Tower where Carrie Ann had worked, then headed to Haight Ashbury where Chip rented an apartment. They were surprised when Carol, Carrie Ann's roommate freshman year, opened the door. Carol, oh my God, what a surprise. We didn't know you were going to be here. How y'all doing? It's so good to see you. They hugged and saw the sorrow in Carrie's, Carol's eyes. And when they saw Chip, they knew it was true. As, Car as Carrie Ann and Jenna Lee crossed the threshold, they were surprised to see how run down the place was with Carrie Ann and Neatnik struck by the sight of pressed roaches decorating the wall. Worse looking than the apartment was their friend, whose beautiful face was covered with sores and pockmarks. They greeted Chip with hugs, and Jenna Lee didn't miss a stride. You know, Chip, the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals once came after me for squishing water bugs with my, my feet and frying them with a magnifying glass. Looks like you, look, you've been a little cruel with the roaches. The ones on the wall received mercy. The other ones I ate. The laughter broke the tension as the visitor saw Chip had his sense of humor. He managed to grin, and all were reminded of how carefree and joyful he was in college. He said to Carrie Ann, I heard you moved to San Francisco. I first thought of moving out here the time you made us California Ranch dressing and served it with vegetables after rehearsal. Best thing I ever tasted. Why didn't you ever call me if you knew I was here? I knew you were busy and didn't want to bother you. It's never a bother to see you. We're here now. I introduced your, your taste buds to the wonders of ranch dressing, but it was you and Jenna Lee who taught me the Texas two-step. Sugar, you damn near broke my toes when you stepped on them, Jenna Lee said. It took me a few tries to get it right, said Chip. Once you did, we were the best looking couple on the dance floor, bragged Jenny Lee. Excuse me, interjected Carol. Your two-step couldn't touch Chip and me when we started the swing. That's right, said Carrie Ann. Carol and Chip dancing the swing couldn't be beat. Do you remember that party we were all dancing on the steps of the university center? And when Chip and Carol got started, and we all moved to the side to give them the center stage? Y'all two were the best. Everyone watched in admiration. What I remember about you, Chip said to Carrie Ann, is your panties. Say what? I took a pair from your drawer and added it to my collection. They were the ones with lace, hand sewn. Shut up. I remember when those went missing. They were a present for my grandma when I started college. I added yours to a collection I strung across my room. You naughty boy, they laughed. Carrie Ann gazed at the hanging basket by the window. Sugar, 
What on earth are you staring at? Jenna Lee asked. That plant. Jenna Lee gave it to me when we were in college, said Chip. It was in sad shape, but I brought it back to life. I've kept it with me, even driving across country when I moved to San Francisco. That's the plant I rescued from you, Jenna Lee said. A shiver rattled down Carrie Ann's spine when she spoke. Now what, why don't we see if we can nurse Chip back to health the way Jenna Lee and Chip saved my plant? When Carrie Ann started her search for a full-time position, she contacted her supervisor at Genentech to catch up and inquire about openings. She learned Gen Genentech decided to, to license the synthetic insulin to Eli Lilly, the Indiana-based pharmaceutical giant, and there might be an opportunity for Carrie Ann with her knowledge of chemistry, the product, and Genentech's inner workings to assist Genentech transfer the technology to Lilly and assess Lilly, assist Lilly with the launch. Back then, pharmaceutical companies scoured colleges for positive, attractive, outgoing women to hire as sales representatives, and cheerleading experience was a strong credential. With Carrie Ann's athleticism, outgoing personality, public poise, not to mention her scientific background, product knowledge, and a Stanford MBA, Lilly executives saw Carrie Ann as an excellent candidate for the synthetic insulin project team. She demonstrated her negotiating skills by obtaining an employment contract with Genentech that allowed her to continue living in the Bay Area and benefit from the company's instead of stock options will assign as a liaison to assist Lily, introduced the product. You can move a Texas gal to California, but you can't take Texas out of the gal, and Carrie Ann knew the right times to use her southern southwest charm to open doors to large customers as she trained and assisted the Lily sales team. Eventually, it became clear to Lily executives they needed to carry Ann on their team 100% of the time, and an arrangement was made for her to join Lilly. Although the company was based in Indianapolis, she was permitted to keep her home in the Bay, Bay Area and traveled throughout the country, assisting regional reps open doors and write up orders. Since all doors seemed to open for Carrie Ann, Lilly's VP of Sales drafted her into the sales department. The woman who began her career as a chemical engineer found herself in the sales trenches with a quota where she effectively managed and grew accounts with her strong customer service skills. At her first Lilly Sales Summit, when the Top Gun Award was presented to the rep with the greatest sales percentage of a quota, Carrie Ann vowed, that's going to be me one day. With her eyes set on the top goal, she began her march to become one of the highest performers. Doctors and purchasing managers of hospitals and large group practices could not refuse her visits, samples, and requests for orders. She brought her clients valuable information because she could explain the product's chemistry, how they worked, and benefits to patients. As her value as a consultant and trusted advisor grew, so did the power of her feminine charms. Her appreciation of culinary arts increased as she joined clients for business dinners. The way her wavy blonde hair framed her face, and the way she bent her head closer to talk, the way she touched you gently on the wrist as she spoke, were irresistible. You wouldn't describe Carrie Ann as a classic beauty. She had the large eyes of an owl at night, <laughs> those green eyes, and pearly teeth. Her dentist recommended a whitening program to erase stains from all the red wine and dark espresso, that made you melt like an ice cube on a hot Santa Ana day when she smiled. She had the good clean skin of an ivory soap commercial, and her clothes and accessories were coordinated, including the color of her fingernails, toes, and lipstick. There was a strict professional dress code on the job. She was required to bear, wear pantyhose, and dress sleeves must cover half her arm's biceps. She used all her assets to open doors and, clo and close orders. The guy said she used her ass tits without crossing the line. 
On occasion, when a customer tried to corner her in the back office or after dinner, she firmly and politely refused his inappropriate advances. At her third sales summit, she overheard three men, obviously from the East Coast since they wore three-piece suits, seated a couple of rows behind her discussing her figure. It was one thing to be polite to customers, but she wasn't going to put up with disrespectful behavior from her peers. So she walked up to the guys and said, Hey y'all, I'm not deaf. Y'all should be more discreet talking like that with ladies in the room. Good luck if you're getting your hands, your dog's paws on these, she said, coupling her breasts. Maybe if you doubled your sales, you'd have better luck. She went back to her chair. What silenced them for good was seeing her win the Top Gun trophy that evening. Years of hard work chiseled her features. First, slight bags under the eyes, then crow's feet when she smiled. She was always one to raise a single eyebrow, a look she practiced in high school. The etches creeped into her forehead as inevitable as cracks across a windshield nicked with a stone. When she smiled, you saw a mature, confident woman who sparked desire in men, provided they weren't daunted by her intelligence and ambition. A woman with brains and good looks could be lonely if she intimidated men less strong. In her off hours, you could find Carrie Ann jogging through Golden Gate Park and at home reading the financial section of the paper, scanning stock prices and reviewing annual reports dressed down in, the, in a halter top, sandals with matching toenails and fingernails, red curl and hot pink her favorite colors. She was always well manicured and learned how to color her hair without becoming a dumb blonde. She got a kick running in the beta breakers race. Eventually, she sponsored a team called the Cougars, who wore pink thongs and a pink halter straps as they jogged, ran, and bounced up and down the hills of San Francisco, serving wine at the end of the race to any woman who pledged allegiance to cougarhood, or who wore pink, or was a member of the sisterhood of the inked. The guys and gays were welcome to join too, so long as they pledged allegiance to the Cougars and made a contribution to the kitty. Back in Dallas, Jenny Lee continued to visit David Ray, whose magical hands earned him a reputation as one of Dallas' finest hairstylists. David admired Jenny Lee's hair as much as Carrie Ann, but whereas Carrie Ann approached Jenny Lee's hair with love, David saw her hair as the raw material for creating works of art. David remi- remained her hairdresser for 25 years, even after Jenny Lee and Harlan moved back to the country. Her hair would not suffer and she flew David out every seven weeks to work his wonders. You could take Jenna Lee out of Dallas, but you couldn't get the Dallas out of her hair, not even after she was frightened out of her skin by a stalking cougar of the night. While Jenna Lee attended school during the week and ballroom dance party Friday nights, Carrie Ann was busting her butt climbing the ladder of Chevron oil refineries and the sales ladder of Lily. With the German thrift instilled by her mother and the necessity for saving preached by her father, generally socked away the maximum amount into her 401k plan, a new retirement savings vehicle then just started, saving another 10% of her income in a personal investment account, and took advantage of the company's employee stock purchasing program. Within 10 years, she accumulated over $100,000 in savings and purchased her first home in San Francisco, no small achievement, and a second home as an investment, figuring that to make money in real estate, she needed at least two homes so that when she sold one, she still have one to live in. There was a time in the normal course of stock market swings, she believed Genentech stock was terribly undervalued and made a strategic decision, some called it a gamble, and invested a good portion of her investment account in Genentech that doubled with real physical assets, talking about her houses, guys, not her boobs, which for the record were natural, and financial assets. By the time she was 37, she was financially independent. She continued to make wise investments, fed ideas by her broker and doctors who were customers. 
One was a company in the valley called Intel, still part of her portfolio when she broke ground in her vineyard and financed her tasting room. And while she welcomed stock tips, she always did due diligence before investing. The week before Carrie Ann was to fly to Houston for her 10th college reunion, she received a letter from Carol. Carrie Ann ripped open the envelope to a Xerox page. Dearest friends, it is with great sorrow I write to you about our dear friend Chip, who is now at peace. He was one of my first friends at the UH. Even though he had gained his freshman 15 pounds, didn't we all? He was still gorgeous, and being from West Palm Beach had a beach glow about him. Chip was friends with everyone, and soon we were in a play together. Although he couldn't two-step for beans when he arrived in Texas, he was an incredible dancer, a shagger, and every girl wanted him to go with her to a sorority formal. It was the disco age, and one of my best moments with him came when I was wearing a leotard and matching wraparound skirt. Chip and I were dancing, and we looked good, really good. Pretty soon, people were stepping back and watching us dance, just like Saturday Night Fever. He threw me out for a huge spin, and my skirt spun off and hit someone. He quickly grabbed it for me. We were hysterical. Chip had a magic green thumb and could grow anything. We took an introductory botany class together that fall, Roots and Shoots which he convinced me to take with him. We were partners in the fall in a fall, fall vegetable garden. He got me in a... After graduation, Chip moved to San Francisco to start his career as an actor and convinced me to move there too. Doing a big scary thing never seemed like so much fun. We shared an apartment for about eight months while his roommate was out on tour. It was filled with cockroaches. He taught me how to smooth them on the wall. And our subletter was a prostitute who worked in a nearby corner at night. Classy. Every Wednesday, we set off bug bombs in the apartment and walked out to do laundry and sing show tunes. Again, so much fun, never depressing, even though both of us were failures at auditioning. Time passed, and my day job got more serious. I moved to a less buggy apartment but Chip stayed at his ch- in his cheap place. I couldn't figure out why. And then one day he told me he was sick. He called me from the hospital, and we cried together, sitting on his bed. He had a plan. He was never going to be a burden to anyone, and I was going to be in charge. Was I willing to help him? Of course, I said yes. Sometimes, when people get terrible news, they fall apart. But other people used the worst news as a laser ray to carve their life into focus. He got very involved with gay men's health crisis. There were a lot of men cut off from their families. Chip decided to visit them. He spent hours with patients he'd only just met, comforting them and letting them know they were not alone. He started playing volleyball again because he wanted to make sure he was fit and could fight the disease. He read everything he could get his hands on and joined a clinical trial. He showed me what words like bravery, courage, and valor mean. He was a tough son of a bitch. He made me promise early on that I would help him take his own life. He knew he never wanted to be in pain, but he didn't know what he was made of. He was not ready to go, and he signed up for every possible treatment ready to fight the good fight for as long as it took. When they offered a new treatment that involved drilling a hole in his chest, then pouring medication in, I suggested it was maybe a tad too invasive. He told me to mind my own business. Three days ago, I was walking to the hospital when I suddenly felt I should run. I quickly got to the ninth floor and to his room just in time for him to leave. I felt his spirit hovering in the room for a little while. He didn't want to go. AIDS is a horrific disease. I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I've enclosed copies of my favorite photos of Chip. Look one more time upon him. He was a charming, delightful, compassion, 
generous soul, lost way too soon at 32. Love to all, your Carol. God damn it, Carrie Ann said to Staff and General Lee on a three-way call. He saved my plants, but couldn't save himself. Life's too short. Two days later, UPS delivered a package to Carrie Ann's home. She shook it, but it didn't feel like wine. She opened it and found a note from Carol. Dear Carrie Ann, Chip wanted you to have this and asked me to send it to you after he was gone. He told me to tell you, here's your plant, a living miracle. Its blossoms always gave me joy and a breath of fresh air. Please take good care of it. I pass my, my love of plants to you. Love, Carol. And for the second time that week, Carrie Ann shed tears of remorse for a friend she had ignored, but who remembered her. Life's too short. And the woman once called Killer Carrie Ann in reference to the plant she neglected, vowed to take care of this plant she once owned. Carrie Ann was good at her word. And over time, as weeks melted into months and months to years, the plant responded to her attention and thrived. Carrie Ann never had a green thumb growing up. If anything, she had a red thumb from gutting that deer. But she found as the plant grew, she could cut snippets and place them into another pot, and the offspring of the original took root. She began decorating her apartment with plants. This time, they flourished. All kinds of plants, palm trees, colorful tropical plants from Hawaii, orchids, succulents. She became a plant junkie, and plants her, were her babies. Now, Steph had resigned her position at the prison soon after repaying her student loans and found herself in a marriage almost as nasty as her work. After divorcing, she moved as far away from Huntsville as possible and settled in San Diego to start a new life among ocean waves and palm trees. She invited Carrie Ann for a weekend where they jogged along the wide sandy beaches of Del Mar, went to the track to admire the horses, and partied. San Diego lacked the congestion of the Bay Area, you could even drive on the freeways and had a noticeably laid-back atmosphere com compared to supercharged Silicon Valley. What caught Carrie Ann's attention, being a small-time real estate investor, land values in San Diego were less than half those in San Francisco. She calculated she could purchase a home with whitewater ocean views. Steph suggested Carrie Ann move to San Diego, fertilizing that seed in her brain. Carrie Ann's bi biological clock was ticking hard and fast. She was over 40 and reasoned a family and kids would slow her down. Besides, she was independent and didn't need a husband for financial security. She was content to live alone, dated occasionally, worked hard during the week and partied on the weekends, though less hard than in earlier years. Still, she yearned for a partner, not just anyone, but the right one. Her well-constructed life of hard work, play, exercise, good food, and fine wine had a missing piece. She signed up for an executive dating service targeting successful men, but didn't find a match. One afternoon, she boarded a Southwest flight to Dallas for a medical conference, and her inner Texan was brought out as the crew welcomed her. Carrie Ann could dish it out and go head to head, hairstyle to hairstyle, heels to heels, with any of the rambunctious Dallas-based crew, who caught, which caught the attention of Ken, the, par the plane's pilot. He excused himself from the cockpit to perform a visual inspection of the wings before takeoff, and a closer inspection of Carrie Ann, found her, and gave her a friendly hello, to which she smiled back and replied, Howdy, Captain. He was Cupid struck those green eyes, and after the smoothest landing he could engineer, found her at baggage claim, and not so smoothly but with sincerity, asked her out for a drink. Carrie Ann, a quick judge of character, thought, I could date him, and suggested they meet at the Gaylord Texan Resort and Conference Center in Grapevine on the northern outskirts of Dallas, where she was staying. Ken was waiting in the lobby when she checked in. And after, after she freshened up, 
freshened up. He suggested they go to the Riverwalk Cantina, an appropriate choice modeled after San Antonio's famed Riverwalk, where Carrie Ann grew up. He ordered Coke, since he had a flight the next morning, and Carrie Ann ordered a margarita with an extra shot of aged tequila to sip on the side. They talked about growing up. Ken was from Enid, Enid, Oklahoma, where his father had been an Air Force flight trainer, and Carrie Ann promptly informed him her father was the best trainer in the history of the U.S. Air Force. Thank you. If he, had, if he had known about her interest in wine, they could have tasted several of the up-and-coming Texas wines featured at one of the hotel's bars, or he could have escorted her to the aptly named Grapevine, whose historic Main Street features tasting rooms of several Texas wineries. Carrie Ann missed the nascent Texas wine scene, the same way Paul missed big opportunities in Silicon Valley. It just wasn't time. She sent the pilot home with a kiss on the cheek, went back to her room, and called Steph. Oh my God, Steph, I just had a drink with the pilot who flew our plane to Dallas. The pilot? How was it? I could date him. Is he married? Divorced. Are you going to see him again? Let's see if he calls. He didn't call. When Carrie Ann returned to her room after the conference the next day, she found 13 long stem roses in her room with a note. Thank you, signed Ken. Ken wasn't much for flowery words, but he was a master of grand gestures, and their relationship went from I could date him to they were dating, and it was an ideal situation. His children were grown, and he had no interest in starting another family. While Carrie Ann, career-focused, believed kids would hold her back. She avoided holding her friend's babies, afraid she would drop them. Carrie Ann enjoyed her time with Ken and returning to the serenity of her own home after their rendezvous. What was ideal about seeing Ken, dating Ken, loving Ken, was they could meet anywhere Southwest flew, and she could concentrate on her work during the week. They met fairly often for weekend here or weekend there, and then for both it was back to work. The relationship filled that gap, the longing, the desire in her heart. They had been seeing each other a few years when Carrie Ann received a letter, along with a ticket inside, for a Friday night performance of Phantom of the Opera in Las Vegas, along with a Southwest voucher. Carrie Ann wasn't one to gamble. Why bet in Vegas when I can bet on NASDAQ with better odds? She always said, but she liked Vegas for the food and shows, which she appreciated given her brief but formative experience on the stage. They met at the Bellagio, where Ken had arranged a magnificent suite. As the sun set, they sipped Dom Perignon champagne and sampled beluga caviar and held each other closely until 7 p.m., when they dressed and walked across Las Vegas Boulevard to the theater. Ken told her the phantom for this performance was Kevin Gray, whom he met in a London pub when Kevin was a drama student, and they had stayed in touch ever since. Kevin had been one of the early phantoms on Broadway, and while he wasn't the most famous, he was the most dramatic, and they'd met, and they'd meet after the performance. Carrie Ann had seen Phantom on Broadway, but not accompanied with the man she loved, and she melted into the performance, alternating between holding Ken arm and hand. Afterwards, they met Kevin backstage, and the gracious host gave a tour of the set to the couple, then walked to the Bellagio for drinks. When Ken and Carrie Ann returned to their room after 11 p.m., he lifted her into his arms and carried her across the threshold to the bed, where Carrie Ann, giddy with excitement, stood up and bounced up and down as if on a trampoline, jumping with the joyful carefree carefree glee of a child. At midnight, as the Bellagio's light, sound, and fountain show began, Ken suggested they watch from their window, and with a familiar tune dancing in their heads began, and two spotlights focused on a man wearing a white mask standing in the plaza. It was Kevin who began serenading them with music of the night. 
Oh my God, this is so romantic, said Carrie Ann. Close your eyes, start a journey to a strange new world. Leave your thoughts of the world you knew before. Close your eyes and let the music set you free. Only then can you belong to me. Floating, falling, sweet intoxication. Touch me, trust me, save your each sensation. Let the dream begin. Let your darker sigh give in to the power of the music that I write. The power of the music of the night. As they kissed, he pulled out a ring with a Texas-sized solitary diamond, unlocked his lips from hers, and asked, Will you marry me?